Hey everyone, welcome back. What symptoms are most demonstrative of hypothyroidism? This question is harder to answer than you may think because 40% of people currently on thyroid hormone medication do not need it. And this comes from a recent meta-analysis. And part of how we find ourselves in this situation where people are too quickly given a drug, a thyroid hormone, is because of inaccurate interpretation of their symptoms. So let's cover the symptoms that have been shown scientifically to be the most reliable, the most predictive of hypothyroid, and then also cover the symptoms that are not reliable, and then give you a grading criteria that's evidence-based regarding how many symptoms dictate what level of risk. And I know I'm not giving you this sort of fear-mongering, hey, every symptom means thyroid, but we shouldn't be doing that because when we do do that, we end up with this meta-analysis finding of 40% of people on thyroid hormone, presumably lifelong, that don't need to be. So let's set the record straight. And I did want to just briefly touch on a few risk factors. Because one logical exercise you can go through is looking at your symptoms, but then also taking that in juxtaposition to what are my baseline risk factors. And one that's often overlooked is family history. If you're not sure if you are hypothyroid and you have a strong family history, that increases the likelihood. And conversely, if no one in your family has hypothyroidism, then it decreases the probability. Another, as you may know, is being a female, female hormones tend to have a immunostimulatory effect, and this increases the risk of autoimmune conditions, of which the main causative factor of hypothyroidism is autoimmunity. Now, hypothyroid and autoimmunity are not the same. Hashimoto's or autoimmunity leads to increased risk of hypothyroidism, but there's also somewhat good news here in that roughly 20% of the population has thyroid antibodies as TPO, but only 5% actually convert into full-blown hypothyroidism. So that context is also important to matter. Other things that can be risk factors is if there has been a period of significant stress, if there has been an infection like H. pylori, certain dietary factors may increase risk. Gluten is one, although it's not the majority of people. It, it might be about 9%, so it is something. Although, sadly, too often gluten is, I think, overly uh, blamed, and that also needs to be sort of course corrected, and we've discussed that at nauseum um, in other episodes. Nutritional deficiencies, this is one that's probably relevant to a decent cadre of people watching this video or listening to the audio. One study, and there may have been follow-up studies replicating this also, I haven't checked in a few years, found that long-term adherence to a paleo diet actually increased the risk of iodine deficiency. And iodine deficiency is a risk factor for hypothyroidism. In Westernized countries where iodine has been added back to the food supply in salt, in dairy, and in um, grain products, there is a very low risk of iodine deficiency. However, if you're following a paleo or some other sort of elimination diet where you're only using sea salt that's not iodized, and most sea salts are not, there are some that are, but most are not, you're avoiding most or all dairy, and you're avoiding fortified grains, then you do pose uh, potential risk dietarily. And then also dietary intake of vitamin D, selenium, myonositol, and iron are important potential you know, risk factors that could increase your risk. Okay, so then coming to the reliable symptoms. The first, fatigue. As you probably know, Every cell in your body has a thyroid hormone receptor, and this receptor, amongst other things, dictates the metabolic rate of the cell. So if there's a slowing of metabolic rate, there can be fatigue because you're not converting food into energy. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Your support really does help us pour more resources into these episodes, so it would be very much appreciated.
The second symptom is dry skin. Thyroid hormone stimulates cells that make keratin, and keratin is a structural protein that helps build skin and retain moisture. And this also leads to the third symptom, which is hair loss. Keratin is also needed for the production of hair. However, a thinning of the outer eyebrow might be an exception. And this has to do with shifting of prostaglandins, which is partially age associated. And we'll come back to how you sort of interpret all these symptoms in context. But if you have thinning eyebrows only, that is not demonstrative of hypothyroidism. But if you're noticing scalp hair loss, it's fairly global, then that is. Now for men, it's important to disclose that as they age, more of their testosterone is converted into DHT, and this can cause the receding of the hairline, male pattern baldness. So you just want to be attentive to, is this male pattern, frontal thinning mainly, or is this global? If it's global, it's more demonstrative of hypothyroidism. And with the thyroid gland being located in your neck and the autoimmune process being the most common cause of hypothyroidism. And in that process, there's inflammation in that gland. This can lead to swelling in the gland and therefore cause another symptom or symptoms, neck pain, difficulty swallowing, and hoarseness of your voice. Another reliable symptom is mood swings, not necessarily depression, and we'll come back to that in more detail in just a second, but fluctuations of your mood. And this is due to inconsistent metabolism. Remember that thyroid hormone dictates metabolic rate in the brain of neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. Constipation is another symptom that is a reliable predictor of hypothyroidism because cells in the lining of your intestinal tract are needed for proper motility. If there is a slowing of metabolic function, there can be a slowing of regularity. A less commonly appreciated symptom is vertigo, a sensation of being dizzy or off balance. Exactly why is poorly understood, but it's in part believed that the autoimmune process causes a derangement of the fluid dynamics in the inner ear that helps regulate equilibrium or balance, therefore leading to vertigo. Shortness of breath is another reliable symptom, and this is because we see a hypo or, or a low level of tone in muscles in hypothyroidism, and therefore you may not have adequate diaphragmatic tone and shortness of breath that results from that. And because muscles are effective or affected, it's probably not surprising to see heart palpitations are another symptom that can be demonstrative of hypothyroidism. So that is the list of reliable symptoms. What about the symptoms that are not reliable? And I would say this is equally important because if you do research, sadly, Healthcare educators, in my opinion, don't seem to be discerning between the predictive and the non-predictive, thus leading people to have a higher suspicion of hypothyroid when they look at their symptoms than they actually do. So the symptoms that are not reliable, anxiety, poor sleep, pain, headaches, feeling cold. This one might be a little bit counterintuitive, but it has not been reliably demonstrated that feeling cold correlates with hypothyroidism. Another potentially shocking finding here, again, looking at the rigorous science that has investigated this, is weight gain. And even in individuals who have severe hypothyroidism defined as a TSH over 100, super high, there has not been a high correlation to weight gain. And the final unreliable symptom is depression. There's a small association, but the association is quite small. This next point is about how you interpret your symptoms. And, and please take note of this. This comes from a few different studies that have tried to figure out and, and investigate how do we interpret someone's symptoms so as to know what their level of risk is. 
And essentially, the finding is if you have three of the symptoms that are reliable, three or more, this puts you at a heightened risk for hypothyroidism. However, if it's one or two alone, coming back to my point about the eyebrows from earlier, that is not indicative of hypothyroidism being present. And let me just quote one 2014 observational study. Neither the presence nor absence of any individual hypothyroid symptom was reliable. Participants who reported more than three symptoms had a higher risk, paraphrasing. Now, there's another component to this that we should definitely tie into this conversation, which is like many things in biology, risk occurs across a gradient. So it's not a binary zero, one, yes or no, but rather a graduated risk. So when we look at the level of TSH that correlates with symptoms, people who have a TSH on average of 17 tend to have very few symptoms. People that have a TSH on average of 55 tend to have a moderate degree of symptoms. And people with TSHs at roughly 100 have severe symptoms. And again, this is important coming back to my earlier point because 40%, roughly 40%, technically it's 37.1 percent of people who are on thyroid hormone don't actually need it. They're not treating the cause of their symptoms. And this is why some people flounder for so long. I tried Levo, I, I tried adding Cytomel, I tried a desiccated hormone, and my symptoms aren't consistently improving, or my levels of TSH and T4 and T3 don't ever seem to normalize. In fact, this is something that we have seen so many instantiations of if your levels of TSH, T4 and T3 never seem to make sense, that is oftentimes because you are being given a hormone that you don't need. So just take note of this. And I'll also refer you to what I found to be a, a very insightful conversation and evidenced by the fact that this interview now has over 100,000 views, a conversation with former American Thyroid Association president, Dr. Antonio Bianco, where we really went into much more detail as to why it's so important to interpret your symptoms correctly. A few things, if you do have symptoms that you can do proactively, you can do a thyroid panel. And obviously this is gonna help dig, you know, cross-reference the symptoms and the, the thyroid status that they correlate with. You can supplement with vitamin D, selenium, and myo-inositol, and also improve the health of your gut. We've published two papers today in peer-reviewed medical journals documenting notable improvement either in the symptoms that were thought to be thyroid or the ability to improve absorption of thyroid medication when supporting the health of someone's gut. And there's also some resources for you. Obviously, there's an interview with Dr. Bianco, and we do have a course that walks you through step-by-step step and even gives you a calculator where you can punch in your lab values to have an interpretation. You always want to check this with your doctor, but this gives you a starting point. So in close, the reliable symptoms are fatigue, dry skin, hair loss, neck pain, hoarseness or difficulty swallowing, mood swings, constipation, vertigo, shortness of breath, and heart palpitations. The more of these you have, the higher your risk. Remember three or more. Testing here is quite helpful. And be wary of the overzealous prescribers probably trying to help you, but nevertheless, where we currently are is, again, roughly 40% of people are on thyroid hormone that they don't need. And determining that can be helpful, thus allowing you to shift toward the actual cause of your symptoms. And if hypothyroidism is the driver, then you should see a good response to thyroid hormone medication. Okay, guys, I hope this helps. Please comment and let me know what you think. 